Welcome, everyone. We're going to wait just another moment or two. I see a few folks <clears throat> signing into the room. I did want to take a moment to welcome everyone. Okay, looks like the last couple of folks were in. Welcome everyone to part three in the sustainability series, Practical Tools for Achieving Community and Political Sustainability. This webinar is presented through the Alaska region on behalf of the Administration for Native Americans. I wanted to give everyone a quick introduction to the BB Collaborate user tools before we get started. There is a telephone connection button near the top in the event you are using our audio conference line. There is another button, a little microphone with a red wheel on it. That's the audio setup wizard. Please use this to set up your headset, speakers, and microphones. At the end of our presentation today, if you'll press File and select Exit from the drop-down menu to leave the room. We have a quick response and polling, raising your hand if you wanted to ask questions. We actually aren't going to use those today, nor are we going to use the whiteboard tools that you will see alongside your participant window. We will, however, be using the chat feature, and you can type and ask your questions in here. We will answer them towards the end of the webinar today. As I mentioned earlier, this is being hosted through the Alaska Region TTA Center. Our staff is our regional director, Anthony Kaoli. He will be presenting later. Myself, Angela, I'm the training and technical assistance manager here. And also our technology and e-outreach manager, Charles Peel. He's in the background. He was greeting you this morning. <clears throat> and he's here. Uh, you can chat with him privately in the event you have any sort of diffi technical difficulties. We also have a pool of consultants with various areas of expertise to assist. The Alaska Region TTA Center, like all the other TTA centers, provides free training for project planning and development, pre-application, post-award. We also provide free technical assistance for project planning and development, pre-application development, we provide some on-site TA for grantees, TA for unfunded applicants, as well as other grantee technical assistance throughout the project implementation cycle. You can find information about the Alaska region on our anaalaska.org website. We also host several Google Plus communities for collaborating and sharing resources with other tribes and organizations, both nationally and regionally. And the website for that is gplus.to forward slash ANA Alaska. And of course, you can connect with the national website at acf.hhs.gov forward slash ANA. This is a four-part series. Part one was hosted by the Eastern Region, sustainability, what it is and why it's important. Part two was hosted by the Pacific Region, a long, happy project life achieving programmatic sustainability. We're hosting part three for you today. And part four will be hosted by the Western Region on September 26th, how to achieve financial sustainability. 
There are numerous other upcoming webinars, and for all of the current and past webinars from each region, you can go to the ANA, click on their resources tab, and type in webinars, which will bring you to this nice long website. On September 26th, as I mentioned, part four will, uh, to this series will be hosted by West. On October 10th, part one of our next series will be <clears throat> hosted by West, and that will be on planning and organizing in your project implementation series. Part two of that series will be hosted by the Pacific Region on October 24th. On November 7th, our Eastern Region will host on reporting. And on November 21st, we will be hosting on continuations and grant amendments. A quick overview for today's agenda and learning objectives. We will provide you a brief overview of parts one and two. The focus will be on what is community and political sustainability, a few strategies and tools for building your community and political sustainability. We'll have a successful grantee story for you and a brief wrap up. We hope you leave today with some useful strategies and tools to apply to your project's sustainability plan. In part one, the Eastern Region provided several definitions of sustainability and guided us in knowing how sustainability works in practice and that it keeps projects going long after the initial grant funds end. This is important to maintaining many of the services that are very important to our tribes and communities. They provided an overview of many forms of sustainability deliverables from strategic plans to curriculum development to policies, procedures, and resolutions. Communication plans were highlighted, started from when you initially planned your project, continuing through to project implementation, and continuing on after the project ends. The communication is key to the community and political support development that you will need in seeking to keep your project running as your new program and creating the relationships that need to happen for the support to occur. In part two, hosted by the Pacific Region, they gave us a great analogy of living a long and happy life going from a project to a program, starting with keeping the end in mind and never losing sight of your goals. To keep, this, to keep your goals in mind and what the organization stands for and wants to accomplish, maintain a strong strategic plan and keep hopes and dreams alive. Be sure to address the project all the way through, knowing what the goals are to be accomplished, as well as knowing what is being done well, what needs to be improved. Managing your internal and external resources to the highest levels while keeping communications open and transparent for your stakeholders, leaders, community, and partners. You need to know what you want from your partners and what will make good partners for the continuation of your specific project. And knowing what success looks like for this project, not just chasing the money or empty relationships. In the end, just as in life, following the plan laid out will lead to a long and happy life with little to no regrets. So what is community and political sustainability? Community members that are well, community sustainability is having community members that are well informed of the project benefits. And they then can assist you in advocating for its continuation and for further funding through the tribe, funders, leaders, and other partners. They can also introduce potential partners and funders. They are your path to political sustainability. Political sustainability can be your tribal council, 
your board of directors, your advisory board, state, federal, or philanthropic funders, and other leaders in your communities. Informed and interested funders want to see your, this project continue, and they are interested in working closely with you to fund this effort. Strong partners and leaders continue to support the project with personnel, goods, space, or funds, and can assist in bringing other partners and funding streams. Remember that your relationship building starts when you begin to develop your project, and it continues through its entire lifetime, even as it becomes long-term and sustained. Many people think sustainability, not important. Well, we've all seen a plan and great projects come to a screeching halt when the initial funding is over without a successful plan, without a solid foundation from the community supporting the project and political leaders and other organizational leaders supporting this project to maintain not only financial, but interest in attending and supporting this project. And at this point, we will turn this over to Anthony Cayley. Anthony? Thanks, Angela. Um, so we have, a, we have a concept here that we wanted to share. It's just another way of looking at your project and, and sustainability and tying in the community and the, and the political aspects of sustainability. So this is a, this is a bridge under construction, basically. And uh, it's one of the, you know, it's, it's a solution towards uh, achieving sustainability or a model for that. Um, so the bridge, you can, you can look at the bridge as your project, um, huge project. Um, and the completed span could be your, your program long term. The chasm is, is your problem or your challenge or the obstacle that we're trying to overcome. The community is the bedrock of this project and the foundation of this project. And in this particular example, also the arch, the strong arch can also be the community. The pillars that support this span, that support your project, can be your, your community organizations, your tribe, um, your partners. In some cases, you may have one or two pillars, and hopefully those are extremely strong, or you may have several, depending on how your, your project's designed. Um, During the construction of this particular project, the suspension cables were, were temporary, but they can, they can signify basically the relationship building and uh, efforts to reach out to the different organizations and partners through different uh, communication media to build support. And so, in order to do all of this, you need tools. And that's what we want to talk to you about today. The numerous and several tools. These are not the only tools available, but tools that you can use to sustain your project. One of the first things we want to remind folks about is archiving. Keeping your work stored in a very safe place. There are numerous options for this. CDs and DVDs, which can also be passed out and handed out later. Print copies, and some of those print copies can even be stored in a state or national library. There's external hard drives, servers, and cloud servers. And we suggest that you archive these in a very safe place. We've all seen disasters occur within our communities, flooding, fires. And for a few dollars a month, you can archive gigabytes of project data versus spending tens of thousands of dollars to rebuild and recreate that data after such disaster. 
social media. This is a part of your building your bridge, getting your community support. The transparency of the communication that has been talked about in the previous webinars. You can use Facebook, LinkedIn, Google Plus. You can use Twitter, scoop it to, for articles, and Pinterest for other information. It's all about gaining your community, bringing them together, and places that they can come together to support you and begin the process of advocating for your project. Other ways that we get the word out and keep the word out throughout our project are email and email listservs and newsletters and newspapers and posters and flyers. And there's radio and TV and PSA ads. The key is knowing which of these is the most effective in your community. Is it just having meter meetings with your community and having focus groups or having uh, food at the community meetings? Is it putting flyers in newspapers and post offices in local stores? Or is it radio and TV, depending on how everyone in your community communicates best? And don't forget your social media for bringing them together in a single place. When you're thinking of all this communication, who are your stakeholders? Think of your recent projects. Who were the stakeholders that you brought together and who maybe was missing from the table? Think both about the internal and external stakeholders that are so important to your project. Community leaders, the auntie who holds a, a strong voice, the non, the chief, the local store owner, who, who gave you some of your supplies. The list goes on and on. The key is, again, remembering that the communication and the relationship building with these stakeholders is so important. It is one of the strongest keys that you will have to going from your community support, knowing what your community members want, what is important to them, and gaining them to bringing them together to advocate for the extra political support for the funding and the supplies and the needed continuation of these valuable projects and services. Anthony? Okay, thanks. Um, so another tool that we're going to profile and a little more depth today is, is focus groups. And uh, the purpose of this is to, is to provide you one tool that can help to engage stakeholders in your community and build that grassroots support. And that, that support is done through communication. Focus groups are just one way of, of fostering that communication. A focus group is a small group of people and our project stakeholders who are asked about their perceptions, their opinions, their beliefs, and priorities towards an issue or a service or a concept or a project or an idea. So the example that I'm going to profile today is from the community of Macoriak on Nunavak Island um, in southwest Alaska um, out in the Bering Sea. Now this is a community that I worked with in the past and I was involved in, in their strategic and community planning. Um, communities in Alaska have a lot of different entities, a lot of different players, um, even though the population is small. So that, that makes Alaskan communities somewhat unique. One of the challenges um, in approaching community development is, is building those relationships, especially when you have multiple entities. And sometimes you have the same players or same tribal members that are sitting on multiple boards across multiple entities. Uh, even though they're from the same community, um, you have to focus on, on building 
relationships and working towards a common vision. So that's what we that's what we set out to do in Macoriac and one of the tools that we did use was focus groups. What we were trying to do was to was to provide a mechanism for the community to do their own planning basically rather than having uh, someone come out and present a draft plan which has happened in the past and in some of our communities. The idea here was to engage everybody and have them um, share what their priorities were. So this was one of the tools we used. In this case, um, we we had several different planning dimensions for each of these focus groups that were set up, and the focus groups were organized over the course of a week. Um, they covered different areas of community development, culture and tradition, health and human services, and so on. So we had one focus group for each of these dimensions. And what we did was we we made up these focus groups. Um, we basically put them together with different community stakeholders with uh, typically an elder would be involved in, in each of the focus groups and the, the lead, the facilitator for each focus group was someone from the community, either a program director, a tribal subject matter expert or a department head and basically the only role that the external consultant um, performed in this case was to provide some training to those uh, community members on how to conduct the focus groups. So a manual was put together and I'll go ahead and push that out to share with you just as an example. So you can download that. It's also in our resources. But it lays out, it lays out sort of the, the agenda that was used for each of these focus groups and the process that was that, that we went through. They were typically two to two and a half hours, and we covered the, the you know, housekeeping rules, how to conduct the focus group, what the values were in the community related to that planning dimension, the current status of, of the economy or housing, depending on which dimension we were discussing. And then there was a, a, a brainstorming session with post-it notes um, and clustering of those, a prioritization, a solutions identification and, and measurement. Um, and then identifying activities. The result of that, because we, we set up multiple focus groups, we had individuals from the community leading each of those focus groups and literally every organization that, that is, was in the community participated in some shape or form in those groups. It was a, it was a really excellent way to, to engage everybody and build that community, that grassroots community support that's essential for future projects. And in most Alaska communities, there's, there's huge needs. So the, literally the projects were numerous. Um, and in this case, they were identified in terms of short term, midterm, and long term. So the end result from this process using these focus groups was to help to build that that base, that foundation of support, if we go back to the concept of the bridge, that, that bedrock that's essential for supporting the, the pillars or the organizations that in turn uh, support the project that we're working towards. So looking at our bridge concept, we've got that, we've used different tools now to build that community support. We've got the bedrock in place, a strong foundation We've got the arch that's being constructed. Um, the pillars are coming up. So now, what what is the missing link to complete that span to to have your project mature into a long-term sustainable program? A potential a, the missing link can be solid partnership agreements. MOAs or MOUs. So now what we want to do is we want to share a tool, one of many tools, that can be used um, to solidify your, uh, your partnerships and, and bridge the gap from, from the community support to the political support. Um, so 
before I before I go into MOAs and MOUs in depth, I I, I want to preface this by saying that you know this is these MOAs and MOUs are really they're good tools, but um, it takes that community support to sustain them. And I've, I've, I'm going to give another example later on, but I've been involved in an MOA that's lasted 17 years and witnessed its changes and see it evolve through the process. And I, I know that um, there were periods when the MOA, even though it was standing, uh, because there at times wasn't that community support, it, you know, the MOA really wasn't all that meaningful. Um, so. So that's that's just critical to have that support. So an MOA for and an MOU basically, if you're wondering what the difference is, there really isn't a whole lot of difference. They're, the terms are interchangeable, um, and MOAs and MOUs are often used as a statement of cooperation or understanding about a specific or general topic between two or more parties. Um, they are an agreement used to clarify the roles and responsibilities of each party in a shared situation of interest. So some tips in, in negotiating or putting together your MOAs and MOUs. Because it contains the word agreement and a contract is an agreement, some people believe that an MOA signifies a more significant commitment than an MOU. If you're having difficulty entering a partnership using an MOA, then see if your potential partner wants to use an MOU. Some other tips. Should your MOA or MOU be general or specific? Well, some advantages of being general is that you can use a general MOA or MOU for many different projects. So you can develop a, a basic MOA or MOU that that lays out the framework for how two partners are going to collaborate and then develop more specific MOUs for, for specific projects. The disadvantages of being general is that you may not get cooperation on those specific projects and the roles may not be defined clearly enough and the parties may not sign it as it makes them commit to certain unknowns. Some of the advantages of being specific is that it provides both parties the opportunity to decide whether they want to cooperate on projects on a case-by-case -case basis. And the disadvantage is that there's less flexibility. So we've, in my work, negotiating MOAs and MOUs, um, whether it's long, whether it's detailed or not, again, it falls back on the relationship between the two parties. Um, that's you know, the MOA or MU is just an expression of that relationship. But, you know, practically, if, in practical terms, if they're not, if the two partners aren't actively working together, then, then the MOA, MOA or MOU doesn't amount to a whole lot. Some of the typical elements of an MOA or an MOU include a clear mission statement, a main body, which would include your purpose statement, identify the scope, assign responsibilities, outline the terms of understanding, uh, of course the signatories, signature lines, and then usually you would have a clause for reviewing that agreement once a year, for example, um, and you'd have a time frame. So a lot of the MOAs and MOUs that I've seen are usually short term, but that doesn't have to be the case. If it's just a general framework MOA or MOU, it could be longer term. In a lot of my work, um, I've done both program MOAs and MOUs, but also um, facility and infrastructure MOAs and MOUs. And um, those, those MOAs are slightly different. There's a few things that you really need to address, um, and I'm just going to highlight a few of those. For, for projects where you're trying to bring together multiple funders on one facility, you really have to clearly identify who's going to own that facility, what the long-term strategy is for maintaining and operating that, and how the costs of that are going to be shared. Um, and the duration of the agreement, especially if you've, if you've got commitments for cost sharing for O&M, should be as long as the useful life of the facility. The beauty of MOAs and MOUs is that you can use these as tools to um, coordinate funding for projects, even if they're from multiple entities. If you clarify 
who is going to administer those funds and how the flow of those funds are going to go and how the reporting is going to work um, so that um, the, the legal grantees can satisfy their reporting requirements. You can accomplish anything through these MOAs and MOUs. And in fact, on a lot of my projects, um, we've had literally you know, cities, tribes, other nonprofits contributing towards a single project. And it, it just it it was the MOA that laid it out and made that possible, as well as the the community support um, and the political support. Why are these agreements used? They're used to maximize available funds, to limit duplication of efforts, and to coordinate efforts to avoid redundancies, to establish partnerships to define roles and responsibilities, clarify who's doing what, and bridge different types of partners. So those are just a few examples. So what I'm going to do is I, I have a template. There's, several, there's a couple templates in our public folder that we shared with everybody in our email this morning. I can provide the link again at the end of this. Um, I'm going to just go into one of these, the Tribal History and Culture Project sample. I'll go ahead and push that one out. This is a, a really nice, nice template that you can use to start your own MOA. And I'll go through the sections of it briefly. So in the Tribal History and Culture Project MOA template that I pushed out, um, the, the first part is the preamble. And this, this basically this is kind of the warm and fuzzy. It's you know it's the mission. It's why we need to come together. It's what we're trying to achieve at a high level, and of course it identifies the parties involved. Um, so that's the preamble. And then typically you would have some clauses that would address the intent or purpose, a little more clearly defined, and the scope. Uh, what specifically is this MOA covering? If it's if it's for a specific area, like um, in this case, the relationship between the tribe and the school district to coordinate um, development of curriculum, then um, you would state that here, and the date and term. The next typical element that you'd find in the main body of your MOA is the mutual responsibility. So these are things that both parties mutually are responsible for doing. Working cooperatively to ensure appropriate efficient communication, um, sharing information, um, scheduling joint meetings. And I, I can tell you from my own experience that those, those, uh, the frequency of those meetings is, is really important. I mentioned that I, I was involved in an MOA that's 17 years old. And I've seen during that re relationship where at times the meetings were monthly and when the meetings were only once or twice a year. And I, I, you can see the dramatic difference in terms of the relationship when the meetings are infrequent. Next, uh, in this, this case, you would have the, the one party's responsibilities. And in, in this example, the school district's responsibilities laid out. And the one that I want to point out down below is, especially on like an ANA project, you want to quantify if they're going to provide any in-kind or cash contributions for your project. And if this is uh, if this is something like for operations and maintenance, you're going to want to you're going to want to clarify how long they're making that commitment for. You know, if it's a one-time deal or if it's going to be annually for 10 years or so on. So. And then we have the other party's responsibilities laid out as well. And lastly, the signature lines. So as I mentioned before, your MOA can be short and sweet or more lengthy. And it just depends on, on what it is that, that you're collaborating on. 
So if you look at some examples of, of MOAs and MOUs throughout Indian country, you'll find a lot of different cases. Uh, if you just Google search tribal MOA, um, you, you'll, see, you'll find ones between federal agencies and tribes. There's some very uh, interesting examples between cities and counties and tribes. For instance, the Lummi Nation and uh, Whatcom County and the city of Bellingham have an MOA that deals with how they're managing the watershed jointly. Uh, the Swinomish Indian Tribal Community in, in Skagit County implemented an MOA to coordinate a land use program. I've got a, an example in our resources of the village of Kassan and the school that dealt with how they were going to house an EPA coordinator and, and provide uh, environmental training and work with the school to do that. And then more, more recently, we're seeing a lot more so-called mutual aid agreements, and this is more in the, in the emergency management side of things, where tribes, because of um, actually compared, in some cases, where they have more resources in the local city, are providing um, fire protection. And we, we see this in, uh, we saw this in California after the, some of the fires there in 2005, where some of the tribes in Southern California uh, developed their emergency management capabilities and then, because there was no city or county capacity or, or capabilities, the tribe actually set up a mutual aid agreement and provided those. Um, the one that, that uh, I've been involved with for quite some time is the native village of Quinnahawk and the city of Quinnahawk. And in that example, um, that, that agreement has lasted 17 years. It's been renegotiated about every two years. And it, it literally, in the beginning, merged the city and the tribe's operations so that all of the city and state funding would, was funneled from the city to the tribe. And there was a joint council that was merged as a result of that to coordinate the village services, municipal projects, infrastructure, water, sewer. So literally, every, every uh, development in the community over the last 10 years was the result of contributions from both the city and the tribe coordinated through this, the MOA between the two entities. It was a very, very powerful tool um, for the community. And I mentioned it, it's gone through different iterations and evolute, and, and it's evolved. Um, so currently, it's now a, a framework for, this, for the two entities to collaborate but they're leaning more towards project-specific agreements now to tackle just individual projects. And the MOA, as it currently stands, is just a coordination tool to spell out who's doing what in the community. So to, to wrap up the, the, this example of a tool, um, we, we talked in the beginning about some of the community tools to build um, community sustainability, to build that grassroots support, the bedrock of, of the bridge, um, the pillars, to support the pillars. Um, and then we gave an example of a tool, the MOAs and MOUs, at the political level where that community support lobbied or, or basically worked and got their leadership to sign on to some of these agreements because there was local buy-in. And uh, the focus groups were an example of how that local buy-in was, was uh, developed or built. It's not the only way to do that, but it's, it's, it's a good way to engage people in the community and ensure everybody's had a voice in the project with the long-term goal of, of bridging that span, of making that project become a long-term program and making it something beautiful. So now we have an, a, an actual case study, and I'm going to let uh, Angela introduce the project. So Angela, can you uh, take it from here? Great. We have a, a woman from Sea Alaska, and she was with the New Young Leaders Program. Her name is Sarah. She is the administrative director of this project that was funded by an ANA SEDS grant. Sarah received her B 
BA in Anthropology from Southern Oregon University and has been with the Alaska Heritage Institute since 2006. <clears throat> she is Clinket, originally from Cloak, Alaska, a rural community located on Prince of Wales Island in Southeast. During her tenure with the Alaska Heritage Institute, she has institute assisted in coordinating and implementing youth educational and cultural activities. Welcome, Sarah. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. My name is Sarah Dibdell. My Tlingit name is Anshawaki. Um, like uh, Angela said, I'm originally from Klawak, Alaska. I work for the Alaska Heritage Institute, a regional nonprofit in, um, that is located in Juneau, Alaska. Our mission is to preserve, perpetuate um, the Tlingit, Haida, and Simshan cultures of Southeast Alaska. And today I'm um, fortunate to have this opportunity to present on our Yishadi Nakhti Yan um, New Young Leaders Project that I'm fortunate to be the project director of. Um, a, a large component of our mission is the success and education of, of our youth. And what I kind of wanted to briefly touch on before I talk about the, the details of the project was the vision. And the vision for this project was to create a, our next generation of leaders. Um, and by doing so, creating regional cohorts, um, establishing relationships with our youth. Often we hear from our, our leaders now a, a component that um, has brought them together was their time at boarding school. And historically, we hear that those those we hear the negative of those experiences. But one thing that um, was shared with us that a lot of their relationships were formed early on in, in their younger formative years in, in high school through this experience. And so we want to create relationships with our youth throughout the region. And that's one of the, uh, our vision for this project. Um, we also want to instill pride and strengthen their identity um, our, our project is for both rural and urban students, and we find that bringing these students together, um, they balance each other out. And by doing so, they balance each other culturally but also academically. Um, one of our esteemed elders um, who has gone before us and walked into the forest was Dr. Walter Sobolov. And he instilled in us not only through our organization and through his words, but through his actions was the importance of being lifelong learners and something that we have seen um, of individuals in the communities that are very successful is that they have that same mentality. And so we want our, our generations coming up to have the same mentality and, and work ethic um, and to be engaged, um, to instill the concept that it is not too early for them to be active uh, community members and, and um, providing assistance in their community. Um, we want to ensure that our, our projects have instructors that are from our local communities that are connected and, um, and can provide the leadership. So the Yi Shedi Nakhti Yan project, the New Young Leaders Project, has um, three major components to it. And the first being leadership academies. Um, we actually just held our, our, our year one leadership academy at the University of Southeast Alaska. Um, and it was very successful. We had approximately 50 students participate from throughout the region. Next, this coming year, we'll hold our um, regional leadership academies in rural communities. And again, it's showing that balance of both urban and um, rural life. And we have found that our students that come from uh, our rural communities are very grounded culturally. And they almost become teachers to those students that um, may not have been fortunate to, to learn that, that knowledge and, and experience what it's like to live so closely to our ways of life. 
And then the third year, we'll bring them back together and strongly incorporate both um, the components of, of university life and, and urban, um, the advantages of, of being urban, but also um, mix in the rural and cultural activities. Um, we are in the process of creating the Youth Leadership Council, and this will consist of students that are from the original cohort, and they'll help guide us in forming our curriculum, um, but also we will provide them leadership opportunities throughout the year. And at the end of the project, the goal is to develop an action plan that they will present to the legislature. And this year, to get the kids um, engaged and in thinking about it, we started, um, we started by asking the question, what does what mean? which means strength and, and clink it, mean to you. And so at the Year One Academy, the kids started thinking about what that meant to them in their community so they could go back and start having conversations with their elders, with their aunties, with local community leaders, so we could come together and start forming a plan that they, they will be the drivers on. Um, and then the other component is an education advisory committee. Um, through this project, we've been able to um, work with our contacts and um, those that we have established relationships with throughout the region to provide guidance to our staff in developing and ensuring that, that this project is successful, but also that we're able to sustain it and continue it in our communities. Um, so I briefly touched on already year one, the Leadership Academy. We had approximately 50 Alaska Native students participate. And the areas of instruction that we covered were public speaking. Um, and to get our kids engaged, we actually used spoken words and, and poetry. And it was so successful. Um, we try to incorporate activities that our kids um, will engage in and participate in without them quite realizing that while we were doing this, they were learning about getting up in front of a room and speaking to their peers. Um, and it was very successful. We actually were able to capture the whole, um, at the end we had um, a contest and um, we were able to capture the students providing their, um, their poetry and their speeches about their communities. Um, we focused on the community project and volunteering. Um, the students throughout the year will be um, working with our, our staff to gear up for year two and the projects that we're doing. Some of the ideas that the students threw out were doing community smokehouses or a community garden. Um, we, they, another student had the idea of doing a, a community cleanup and having that become an annual thing. Um, we had Alaska Native language um, in Clinket, Haida, and Simshian. And we find that this is so important. Um, one thing that really stood out and has stood out in our education programs is that we find that our students excel much more greatly when they are connected and have a, a strong understanding of who they are and where they come from. And so we always try to incorporate um, culture and language into, into our programs. Um, Life skills, we did that and we split the kids up amongst um, upperclassmen and, and um, lowerclassmen. And it was to start preparing them for, for college and, and success in high school. And then Northwest, Northwest Coast Art also. Um, so the sustainability of this project, um, that we have found has been successful is that um, we've in, been able to engage with experienced and educated staff and instructors that are uh, connected to our way of life and communities. We've actually found this to be very um, imperative to the success of this program is having individuals that are in the communities that have a good sense of, of um, our youth 
and, and the needs of our youth, and then having them participate in the program to be role models and instructors um, in guiding us. Um, we have formal agreements with organizations. The Alaska Heritage Institute works with the Alaska Corporation, our regional, um, our regional corporation, and in in doing so, they through the Alaska, we were able to um, obtain two interns to assist us this summer. Uh, the University of Southeast Alaska and the Juno School District, we have a formal MOU with them. And we have found this to be very important to the success of, of our program and ensuring that um, two of our largest partners are at the table and helping us uh, in the success of this program. Um, and then uh, I guess the, the last point that I wanted to make was in, in creating these relationships with the community members is that um, our goal is to have these be community-based programs and to encourage local ownership and, and volunteerism. Um, and, and that's it on our program. Thank you so much for the opportunity to, to present. Thank you very much, Sarah. We really appreciate you sharing your project with us and uh, all of those MOUs and MOAs that you have in place and the relationships that you are building in the various communities. So we'd like all of you to take a moment to think about the information that has been presented today and type something in the chat box that is a takeaway that you are going to leave with today, something that you may remember, something that you may use in your next project. And if you would prefer to keep this anonymously, um, you can share those thoughts in an evaluation, which we will be sharing momentarily. And the chat box is in the lower left corner. Okay, well, I hope that you're all thinking of something that is going to be useful for you and you have found things that will be useful to you that you will take away. Oh, there's a couple. Um, the idea of using elders more concretely as well as involving the actual participants more in the planning as a method of ensuring success, that's wonderful. Again, that is part of the community, right? The participants, sometimes we forget that they are part of the community. And I really like the reinforced emphasis on community engagement and buy-in. And MOA, MOU is a great way to do that. Thanks. Okay. Well, thank you for sharing those with us, and um, we're always happy when there's warm fuzzies that folks get to take away. So we will be having some resources for you. Anthony, you want to tell them a little bit about that? Sure. Okay, we put, a, we put together a few resources for you. Um, one of the most helpful ones is really if you go to the, the ANA national website to the resource directory and um, type in sustainability, you, you'll, you'll get a whole range of resources for you. Um, the past sustainability webinars, the uh, different sustainability tools. If you look at the ANA nonprofit toolkit, there's a template in there for doing your own strategic plan, community planning. That can be really helpful. And then there's also the ANA resource directory, which includes profiles of different funders and partner organizations. And of course, our, your regional training and technical assistance providers are 
a huge resource for you that can help navigate some of these resources, provide technical assistance to you, provide um, project development ETA and pre-app ETA, and of course our workshops and training that we provide. So that's just a, a sample of some of the, the resources that are available for you. Angela? Thank you. And as Anthony mentioned, um, that that document is being shared with you. He typed a link into the chat box that you can all access. And he is pushing out a PDF that you can view and save now as well. All you have to do is click Save. It will save to your, directly to your computer. This is our contact information as well as some contact information for all of the other regional PTA centers since many of you come from uh, various places. You can contact the center most near you. And at this time, we are going to put out an evaluation that you can literally fill out right here before you leave the room, as well as um, we will put the link in the chat box in the event um, you're having some technical difficulties with the actual form on your page. And at this time, we are starting to run out of time, but if there were a few questions that you wanted to type in the chat box, we're happy to take those. And Deborah, early on you were asking how the new Young Leaders Program was sustained and their plan for sustainability. I wanted to make sure that you um, got your questions answered as Sarah was speaking. So if you could um, raise your hand, which is up near the, right under your name in the participant. Okay, good. I just wanted to make sure. Thank you very much. And if there are other questions, please feel free to type those again in the chat box and we will spend a few moments answering them. And in the meantime, before you leave, we would ask that you would fill out the evaluation form. We hope that you all enjoyed the presentation today. We are very thankful, Sarah, that you were here. And we thank all of you for coming. Angela, I wanted to share one last tip on uh, MOAs. And this is uh, going back to the, the MOA between the city and the tribe. Um, believe it or not, in some cases, uh, we can be victims of our own success. and when you have a long-standing relationship between multiple parties, it's really critical to not only maintain the constant communication, but when you achieve things, you need to also acknowledge the contributions of everybody that's participated equally and fairly. So that's just a tidbit of advice. Great. Well, again, we hope that you'll take a few moments to fill out the evaluation form, and then um, as you leave the room, select File up in the upper left-hand corner, and then exit from the drop-down menu. I hope you all have a great day.